So, you want to be an academic rock star, but just don't have the chops? No problem. We can make you the hottest thing since Einstein with this one easy trick. P-hacking. Kidding aside, this video is part of a series on videos on p-hacking, what it is and why it's so dangerous for science. I have a pretty detailed high-level explanation of p-hacking in the first video in this series, so if you're not familiar with the idea, please have a look there first. I'll put a link to that below. But in a few seconds, researchers are motivated to get what's called a p-value to be below a threshold of 0.05. If they do that, their findings are considered meaningful and they can typically publish their results. If they don't, well, all their work is largely wasted. And to get those p-values below 0.05, there are some very dubious and unethical approaches they can take. In this video, we'll dig into one of those unethical approaches that researchers can use to p-hack their data by dropping experimental conditions that don't work. Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and in this video, we're going to dig into one of the key p-hacking approaches, dropping conditions that don't work. So let's jump right in. In many research disciplines, the gold standard methodology is what's called a randomized experiment, or a randomized controlled trial. Basically, you randomly assign your participants to two or more groups and compare something important across those groups. A drug trial is a classic example where some people get a placebo and some people get the drug. You then compare how effective that drug was across those groups. But let's imagine a different situation where a researcher is interested in how financial incentives can help motivate people to go to the gym. They devise an experiment where they tell people that if they go to the gym three times a week for four weeks, they will get paid some amount of money. They randomly assign all the people in their experiment to earn either 10, 20, 30, 40, or $50 at the end of four weeks if they hit their goal. And their key prediction is that the more they pay people, the more they are likely to meet the goal of going to the gym three times per week. And after four weeks, they find this result here. In four of the groups, 40% of people hit their goal, but in the group where people were paid $30, 50% of people hit their goal. And without getting into the weeds of the statistics, let's assume that 40% versus 50% in all the cases here is statistically significant with a p-value of 0.04. In other words, it is the case that if we compare, for example, how many people hit their goal when paid $30 and $40, that difference is statistically significant using the conventional cutoff of 0.05. But if you and I look at all the results here, we'd probably conclude that the key prediction that paying people more gets them to go to the gym more is just wrong. Yes, more people who are paid $30 hit their goal, but overall we clearly see that more money doesn't translate into more gym attendance. And yet, if the researchers choose to p-hack, they just might be able to write and publish a paper showing that higher financial incentives encourage people to work out more. In fact, all they would have to do is show you that when they compare $10 to $30, you find a statistically significant result, and then just not report the other three conditions. As in, in the published paper, they would just compare those two conditions and call it a day. And in fact, without manipulating or faking any data, that key result, 10 versus 30, does come back with a p-value of 0.04, which, as we said before, is below the conventional cutoff of 0.05. So even though the researchers aren't being super forthcoming about all they did, this isn't a big deal, right? After all, the result comparing 10 and 30 is what it is. They didn't lie at all about that. Hopefully, you realize that in fact, this is a huge problem. And the reason is that the researchers didn't predict that $10 versus $30 would be the key and the only hypothesis that they would test. If that were the case, as in regardless of what conditions they ran, the only possible way that they would ever write their paper is if this comparison, 10 versus 30, was statistically significant, then in fact they'd be fine, even given the other not-so-perfect results. Instead, however, what they are actually predicting by dropping the conditions that didn't work is that any combination of two conditions, which showed that more money resulted in more gym attendance, would let them publish their results. If $40 resulted in more gym attendance than $30, they'd write the same basic paper. If $50 resulted in more than $10, same thing. $20 more than $10, same thing again. In fact, there are 10 possible combinations of results that they would consider a success. Ones where more money equal more gym attendance. But the problem is that when researchers have the latitude to pick which comparison they will report only after seeing the results, they are unfairly giving themselves extra chances to be successful. And this all has to do with how p-values work. Imagine if we play a game where I roll a six-sided die 10 times with my eyes closed. 
I then have to make a prediction about what number comes up on the first and only the first die. Well, my odds of being correct are 1 in 6. We all get that. That is the equivalent of a single statistical significance test, where I make a single prediction. But what if I just have to predict that a number comes up on any of the dice that I rolled, and not just that first one? Well, now I get 10 chances to be right. So the odds of me getting this guess right go way up. It's much, much easier. And critically, if I win this game, it's just dumb luck on my part. And this is exactly what happens when researchers have the ability to pick any result from a series of statistical tests after they see the results. If all I have to do is predict that a number comes up somewhere in the set of 10 die rolls without specifying which die I'm talking about, I have a ton of chances to be right. And if I predict that some comparison among the many that would verify my hypothesis is correct without specifying which one I'm talking about in advance, I have a ton of chances to be right there as well. In the financial incentive example, the 10 comparisons that would have enabled the researcher to write basically the same paper are exactly like the 10 die rolls. In neither case is a specific prediction being pre-specified. Rather, in both cases, you get to try 10 times to find success. This is the heart of this type of p-hacking. It's the ability to make a choice about which comparisons you want to claim as the key one, the one that will let you claim that your hypothesis was correct, after you see all the results, and without any specific singular prediction. If you do this, you are increasing the likelihood that the result you found was a false positive, a result that appears to be real in your data, but has no reflection on reality. And not just by a little bit. In the example with the financial incentives, the likelihood that the 10 versus 30 dollar comparison is a false positive is actually about 10 times higher than the researchers are claiming. In fact, if they were honest, they would report a corrected p-value using something like a Bonferroni correction, a topic for another video. But this correct p-value would take that 0.04 we saw before and turn it into 0.40, something well above our 0.05 cutoff, and something that couldn't be easily published, but would be closer to the true p-value than what the p-hacked version of this would give them. And remember, if the result is a false positive, then we've learned nothing about how financial incentives influence gym attendance. But we won't know that because the researchers had never told us what they actually did. They just reported the two conditions in their experiment that worked. And for you, the consumer of that research, because you aren't told about the other four conditions in the experiment, it looks to you like everything was done on the up and up. The researchers made it look like they only tested that one and only one comparison, but in reality, they tested a whole lot more, but never told you about what they did. Now, to be clear, this is a bad research practice, to say the least, but it is not a research practice that everyone engages in. And since the 2011 paper first calling out p-hacking, even guilty researchers who simply didn't realize just how bad a problem this is have reformed their research practices. And to combat this type of behavior, many academic journals now require researchers to actively state that they are reporting all experimental conditions. I suppose some people might still lie, but if they do that, now they're turning to just straight up fraud, something I don't think too many people are willing to actually do. I hope you now understand a bit better this one form of p-hacking, dropping conditions that don't work. In the other videos in this series, I'll cover three other forms of p-hacking, as well as a tool that can be used to detect p-hacking in published work. And if there's a form of p-hacking that you want to share with me that I'm not covering, please leave a comment below, and I'll make sure to keep the conversation going. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.